Hi guys, welcome to my presentation for the Autodesk Advanced Manufacturing Summit 2020. My name is Janne Kitanen and today I will be talking about one of my dearest topics, 3D TI, 3D Thermal Form Injection. Now, I have been in the 3D printing industry for a long time, maybe 25 years give or take, but I've always struggled to find this mega super scalable application that will spin people's heads around and and also help them understand that the solutions don't have to be so complicated and you know what guys this is it but also bear in mind that the presentation might be so wild that and also here's the reason why i'm doing the car then you actually might want to buckle up 3D TI, merging the best of 3D printing and packing technology for breakthrough manufacturing solutions. After spending the last 25 years within the 3D printing industry, I've come to realize that the most scalable applications are actually quite simple. I will be talking about 3D TI in this presentation and I will demonstrate for you how to create the most scalable and the most profitable applications with 3D printing. Yes, you heard it right. The most scalable and the most profitable applications. But before we start talking about 3D TI, uh, let's chat a little bit about disruption and what are we actually disrupting. Um, now, I see these kinds of media stories uh, a lot everywhere, from, from uh, CNBC to CNN to to, uh, to Wadna News Network. And, and my key question here is, what are we actually disrupting? What are we actually disrupting? So all these news stories uh, tell a story about how 3D printing is going to transform the 12 trillion manufacturing industry and fueling the fourth industrial uh, revolution uh, on its path. But um, let's dive a little bit uh, into the history of everything and, and look into the 3D printing industry growth metrics and how things are actually being tracked. So the fundamentals of the 3D printing industry's success and growth is, is measured in machine sales and software sales and material sales and all the technical and technological uh, aspects that come within this particular industry. And if you look at this graph, you know, it looks great, you know, 20, 30% uh, growth uh, every year for the last 35 years. But if you indeed want to disrupt that 12 trillion manufacturing sector, you know, it would take quite a bit of time. You would need probably a few millennia in order to come to, uh, you know, those kinds of numbers. So, and in order to fully demonstrate this, I wanted to dissect one industry and, and give you a kind of a, a background information. What does that mean if we're talking about, let's say, hardware and, and machine sales? And, and you know, what kind of numbers are we talking about? And of course, there's a lot of progress and a lot of media uh, articles also about uh, footwear and how 3D printing might, again, disrupt a 400 billion global market. Um, but in order to demonstrate what it means uh, when the success is measured in selling technology rather than selling the end product. So within with these couple of slides, I'll be demonstrating what, what does that mean. So on the left, you have the footwear global sales pie, uh, 400 billion market, which uh, boils down to about, um, you know, estimated 24 billion uh, shoes per year. But if people are talking about, you know, disrupting the footwear industry with 3D printing, then on the right, you will kind of see what, what it boils down to. So I'll just make, make this graph uh, focusing on the bomb market, which is coming coming together from the materials and labor and overhead and machines. Pretty much that that pricing uh, trajectory when it leaves a port, uh, let's say, for example, in, in Shanghai and goes to the Western world. So it is estimated that the machines create a very small, only $1.5 billion industry uh, within the footwear manufacturing world. Um, and also bear in mind that these companies do not even buy machines every year, nor would they upgrade an existing machine also uh, every year. 
Uh, if you look at footwear, the, the way that things have been manufactured for, for decades, I mean, uh, a lot of the core technologies have not changed for, for a long, long time. Uh, so most factories still make the shoes uh, in, in a very same way as they made, uh, you know, several, several decades ago. So what would it mean for the 3D printing industry if it were to disrupt not the 400 billion market here, but let's say the 1.5 uh, billion dollar market? Let's say we're very positive about the, the penetration of 3D printers into this industry. I would guess, let's say, let's say just 1% of the entire footwear machine sales market. And, and then you kind of in a, in a ballpark of 150 uh, million industry out of a 400 billion global uh, footwear marketplace. So again, the machines themselves are, are many times, you know, a very, very small portion of an entire, entire industry and where the end products are the ones that are, are creating uh, creating the most value for the user. And at the end of the day, then nobody cares how things are made. They just care about what kind of product are they getting in their hand and, and what kind of value that is going to create for them or for their, for their, for their, uh, for their lives. Well, if the money is not in the machines, uh, then how disruptive are parts? You know, you see all these kinds of media stories out there as well that we're able to uh, you know, optimize parts uh, to to you know make them lighter. Are we able to uh, uh, consolidate parts? Um, you know, instead of you know being multiple five, six, seven uh, uh, assembly parts, you can make that into one one piece. So that is all great, but you need to remember that incremental value within a part within an industry uh, will not create exponential opportunity. It will create incremental uh, opportunities. And this particular example may be the engineer's dream, but modifying or optimizing a part is a mere incremental improvement in a, in a bigger, uh, bigger scheme of things. Um, and also one thing to, to bear in mind, when incremental improvement is created, but with a higher cost, uh, most companies' accounting systems are not created to support such innovation. You know, these companies are looking at the world in a very linear fashion, and even if you're part is, uh, you know, uh, 20, 30% lighter. It will, uh, you know, increase your efficiency in your uh, supply chain, your inventory, uh, your purchasing and all that. Even if from an outset, it might look uh, phenomenal, but these systems in many companies are not uh, connected in a way that that one part would then add value for all these different departments. They, so many times these kinds of projects, uh, they get killed by just the purchasing who has to prove that every aspect of the part is better, cheaper, and all that. And many times 3D printing, unfortunately, is more expensive as a line item, and then these projects uh, remain, uh, remain uh, nice to have. Here is an example of a solution, which is uh, not selling technology. They are selling smiles. And everything in this path to get to this final product uh, is created from a scratch from a uh, from the manufacturing to, to, to the software, uh, to the scanning of the teeth at the dentist, uh, to, to the sales channels, uh, to distribution and, and beyond. It is incredibly interesting use of 3D printing, but it is not the means to an end. It is, they are creating tools for 3D printing. They're not creating 3D printed products as the end result. Um, and you see these kinds of examples on, on every, every 3D printing fair and everybody's uh, uh, you know, desk on their booth. You see uh, different different examples for the dental industry. But if you look at the amount of material that has been uh, uh, consumed for this particular application, it is with, you know, with these guys, it is only five pallets of 3D printing material per day. So again, only five pallets of 3D printing material per day, whilst they're generating revenue of uh, 1.3 billion uh, per year. So again, the comparison between the end product and the value they're creating and the amount of money they're being able to charge for the end, end user is astronomically higher uh, than for the parties who are making the machinery, making the software and making the, making the materials. And this will be my, there will be a second conclusion coming after this, but this is the first conclusion about the history pretty much and, and where we came to um, me talking about 3DTI today. But the biggest impact of 3D printing and the biggest upside for 3D printing is not in what the sales are going to be coming from the machines or materials or software, but what the technology delivers. 
So again, the biggest upside for 3D printing is in what the technology delivers, not the machines, not the materials, nor it is the software. We had a 10 minute introduction to a 3D TI. I mean, prior to, I'm gonna start my presentation. And ironically, 3D TI works very similar to Visalign, uh, but now kind of for everything else. So imagine if we were able to merge 3D printing and packaging technology to bridge the gap between 3D print customization and mono product mass production. And we would be able to do it faster, cheaper, and in more materials than traditional high volume manufacturing technologies can offer today. May seem impossible, and many of you might think I'm smoking something, but uh, the goal really with 3 dti has been to beat mass manufacturing industries and disrupt entire industries, and at the same time, and again, just as a nice bonus, we're able to customize the production batteries from uh, one to a hundred to a uh, hundred thousand to a million. For us, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. It will offer them both customization and full scalability. And next in line, I will show you a video. Technically, uh, everything works for our uh, first application, which is in the frozen confections industry. So enjoy, enjoy the one minute video to show exactly how the technology works. TI addresses the gap in the market, which is economical, high velocity batch manufacturing. By combining packaging and molding in the same product, our process eliminates terms such as mold opening times, uh, packaging or labeling, which traditionally happen at separate assembly lines after a product has been produced. So again, if you look at it from a perspective of 3D printing, uh, there's a lot of talk about for example, the term end-to-end -end products or, or digital workflows and, and stuff like that. But many times they are talking about the entire process chain of how to get a, a file automated into the 3D printer and getting it automatically somehow you know, cleared uh, uh, and quality controlled and checked and all that when it comes out of the 3D printer. So 3D TI goes a few steps uh, further from that. So these products also come fully, fully labeled uh, in their own packaging from the assembly line. And for us, when it comes down to what kinds of materials uh, we, can, we can utilize, for us, it doesn't really matter. We can use any liquid, paste, or gel-like substance, uh, whether it's a tomato soup or a toothpaste or popsicles, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but we have a few um, different vertical focus points where we're starting off with, and frozen confections just happen to be uh, the first one. And here's a reason why, if you compare the traditional way of making uh, these kinds of products um, and to the way that we're doing them, we have done a number of different things here which dramatically change the way um, these products have been made. 
participate. You know, so for the ones who've been in an ice cream uh, factory before, you you will come to realize how gigantic these plants are, and, and what kind of a, it's kind of a, like walking into Starship Enterprise uh, kind of a setting. Uh, we have dramatically shrunk down everything, but at the same time, we can still reach the same speeds as the traditional uh, way of uh, doing that is. But again, as a nice bonus, we can make any shape um, and doing for the fraction of the cost than, than existing technologies. Here's another example of how uh, you were to compare our technology. So normally the way popsicles are manufactured, they're manufactured on a, on a kind of a vertical, either a conveyor belt or a uh, rotating uh, system. We have you know, either hundreds or tens, uh, depending on the size of the machine, but let's say uh, there's hundreds of uh, steel molds in the machine. Uh, so anybody can kind of do their wild guess how much it costs to change these tools and then how much time and effort it takes to put an entire factory on hold in order for you to do that and what kind of costs are, are involved, being involved and how eager these companies who have their factories already operational Imagine you go there and, hey, listen, I want to make a hundred of these uh, new shapes uh, of popsicles. They're not going to be uh, not going to be very happy uh, putting putting their factory in hold. So here again, if you were to change the steel tooling, let's give or take, put a hundred thousand uh, price tag on on that uh, all those tools. And if you compare it to our twenty dollar investment on on a plastic tool, it's uh, it's rather rather different. I also many times uh, do not see very clear data on, on 3D printing applications. Uh, at least I don't, when I, when I see new kinds of applications coming out and I always ask people, so what was the price? And many times I don't get any response on the social media posts, which kind of gives me an idea, uh, gives me an idea that many times these are done for marketing um, uh, purposes. So I wanted to be hundred percent transparent and, and show you what it boils down to when you creating a plant uh, like a 3D TI frozen confection plant when comparing to traditional way of doing that. We have done the math all the way from uh, sewage costs to, to electricity, to, uh, to the manpower, to cleaning, to, uh, to throughput uh, and so forth. You know? So here's a graph that will, will show you how you would do it with us if we were to make it in the same speed and same kind of throughput that an, an existing industrial uh, plant would do it. Um, so you can take a moment and study this for a little bit. Very transparent. And another thing which I also wanted to point down here is that every product vertical has their own pricing elasticity. I have never been a big believer in, hey, we've got this new 3D product. Uh, uh, we can make it so fancy and custom and special and all that. But the consumer is not going to pay 20 euros for a custom uh, popsicle. They will want to pay the exact same amount of money as they've been paying for the normal popsicle they would buy in a grocery store. But the consumer is getting smarter uh, by the day and the, the new kids on the block, they will just wanna have a more tailored solution as, as there was before, but they wanna be paying the exact same amount. I titled this slide, uh, New Paradigm in Customization. Um, and let's pause here for a moment and look at those numbers. With 3 TI, we are not just disrupting old industries, but we're also disrupting the entire product development path to an end product. So again, if I were to want to make a custom product for, um, I don't know, let's say, let's pick a Disney uh, theme park here, for example. Uh, it's incredibly difficult for, uh, for, for these massive companies uh, to do that. And you know, it's, it's very costly, it will take a long time. Those numbers are now totally different with 3D TI. And on top, we're able to add a very three-dimensional customization that, that has not been possible up until today. And here's our uh, conclusion number two from 3DTI. Um, yes, we are able to beat mass manufacturing with 3DTI, and yet we are able to provide any tailored, tailored solution uh, as, as a bonus. The next slides will show some examples of, of the work we have done and for what kinds of brands, what kind of new uh, channels we have created. And those of who, you who don't know the frozen confection industry, um, if you look at the way that the popsicle was, was, was invented 1905, uh, they're still selling the same shape in the store. So ironically, nothing really has changed over, over 100 years. And that has also been one of the reasons for us to look at industries 
which have uh, not been touched by the 21st century uh, digital uh, era? And, and how could we rethink how these kinds of products are, are being made? And again, everything has been made in vertical molds until now. And we have literally just changed the entire process, becoming a horizontal process. And we're injecting directly inside the packaging of the product, which is also inherently the, the mold of the, of the product. Here's some more examples of uh, baseball teams, uh, zoos, uh, uh, corporate gifting, uh, large companies, uh, and so forth uh, that we have uh, worked with and uh, created pilots uh, for in the last um, couple of years. And here also is a good example of, of our progress. Um, and also in our in my earlier slides, I, I was mentioning that a digital workflow or end-to-end -end, uh, product in the 3D printing industry is rather different than what we're doing. We're literally diving deep into how to create a factory. And every pipe and electrical socket and, uh, and uh, regulation and, and, and you know, walking path inside the plant, you know, how does an entire thing operate? And 3D printing many times is a very small part of it. It is an, it is an engine within the bigger factory in a very similar way as uh, Align Tech does with their, with their Visalign, but it is not the means to an end. It is a tool. And again, so we have uh, created uh, by now four different factories, uh, two in America, two in Europe. So we're well on our way with our first application to make this into a big success. And we're on our journey, stepping into the new applications uh, that I'll be also demonstrating uh, later during, during this year, uh, from foodware to soap and uh, beyond. Now, ice cream is great, but we'll, what else can it do? Most people in the 3D printing industry don't really understand why on earth are we busy with ice cream? And I can only imagine that since 3D TI is not a technical project, but it is rather a project that aims to disrupt entire industries. So it's a little bit more difficult to grasp than, than doing an incremental improvement in, in a particular, particular vertical. The key for using 3D printing for manufacturing in, in the most profitable and effective way is, is truly to understand how all these different industries operate. When one does understand how they operate, one can then embark on a journey of creating entire new types of uh, markets like uh, Align Tech has done with their Visalign product. But again, it's not, it's not all roses, so a uh, note of caution here, uh, here as well. It uh, took them also many, many pivots uh, to understanding how to, how to get there. So creating brands, creating factories, and doing it yourself is incredibly expensive uh, by itself too. But I've always been on the opinion that if you're if you're trying to create something different, you know, try to create something crazy, try to create something something big, because you know I always use this analogy of, for example, creating a restaurant. No offense for for people starting their corner restaurant, but but at the same time, if your goal is to make a restaurant of let's say twenty seats or thirty seats or forty seats, your revenue is already capped. You can only have X amount of servings per day. So it's very difficult to all of a sudden make a, a billion dollar business out of a corner cafe when you only have 30, uh, 30 seats, for example. So that's what I mean by thinking exponential and getting away from incremental mindset. Here are some addressable market opportunities in uh, various other industries. Um, and this is, again, it is just the market size. So note of caution, it is not our goal to or even try to tell people that, okay, we will capture, uh, you know, 5% uh, or 10% of, of the bakery industry. Uh, absolutely not. We're, we're there to create new industries uh, and, you know, sales channels, uh, manufacturing plants, all of that. So many times it's a very, very painful and long, long journey, but at least we have these big industries uh, behind us where, where we will be able to carve different, different niches from, from, uh, from the ice cream world to, to the bakery world, the chocolate, uh, to footwear, to all kinds of silicon parts, uh, polymer foams, and, and and so forth. You know, so there's a lot of a lot of different opportunities um, uh, for us in the horizon. And and another thing which I wanted to mention is that we're not by far not experts in any of these fields. We're also not experts in the frozen confection category, and we don't want to go through that painful uh, process or journey again. So we would love to collaborate with parties who are already. Uh, masters in these different industries and they have a foothold in uh, perhaps a sales channel, 
perhaps they have a brand, perhaps they have a new channel that, that we haven't even not even thought about. So we're very open to collaborating. Um, and then here are just a couple of examples where we know through our key IP and our patents uh, that the certain innovations are also be a very, very interesting, just purely from a packaging industry, from the aluminum casting, also metal casting industry, uh, foam industries, uh, uh, ceramics, soap, footwear, and, and so forth. And I would love to end my presentation with this one one-liner, um, but before I go there, um, I wanted to give a little bit more background on, on why I got into 3D printing and why I also fell in love with it, and also why I've been ever since trying to find a different path for me in this industry and how to find those most scalable and profitable applications. Um, I really fell in love with the complexity that 3D printing can offer, and, and of course, that is the heritage of all my artwork uh, from creating the most complex uh, dresses and furniture pieces and lighting and footwear and eyewear and, and, and you name it. But the older I've gotten, I have always wanted to actually swim the other way. And instead of finding the complexity, the beauty in the complexity, I want to find the beauty in the simplicity. And many times people who are, again, if you pause there for one minute, uh, finding the results in the simplicity and not in the complexity, Again, many engineers uh, say that uh, complexity in 3D printing is free. If from an engineer's perspective, maybe complexity uh, can be free because you can rotate that complex uh, product on your screen uh, in the same velocity as you can rotate the, the simple product that you can 3D print it pretty much at the same time. But from a, from a mar market perspective, it is a myth. Again, reducing assembly and parts, uh, which inherently uh, should result in a simplified cooler control and, and reduced um, procurement uh, hassle uh, may seem like a no-brainer, but also need to understand that this innovation you created challenges in the entire systems of how these big companies have been operating for, for many, many years. So even if your product created all these benefits, but with a higher cost, reducing complexity on the parts, just created a headache on the other side for somebody doing the purchasing. There's in order for it to create a bigger impact, you need to be cheaper, and 3D TI does just this. So 3D printing is great for making complex and expensive parts slowly, and 3D TI is great for making simple and inexpensive parts fast. I hope I have inspired you with my presentation, and I hope 3D TI has given you some inspiration on, on how to look at 3D printing as a whole. And, and again, as I mentioned previously in my presentation, we're very open for, for collaboration. And by all means, uh, if you have ideas for 3D TI, we're not the only ones with the ideas. We love to collaborate. So let's get in touch and make magic together with 3D TI.